We're in this room together, not just to talk about platitudes, to go over the same old ground we have all been discussing since the launch of ChatGPT before Christmas. Our role here today, together, through Slido, through concrete discussion, is to come up with strategies for action. We're here to find a middle ground. We have a very polarized conversation going on at the moment, as ever with disruptive technologies. We have those who are saying we need to forge on ahead and do so without further ado. We have those on the other side, the nation states and others who say we need to stop, or indeed some of those who purport to be acting in an altruistic manner by putting out moratorium letters. I won't uh, name any names there. But we're here to be above all activists and activists from the ground up. We're here to represent stakeholders, connect, build bridges. And as we're building those bridges, we need to remember the most important stakeholders of all, which are the next generation, Gen Z, the voices which have been marginalized perhaps up until this point, out of all the discussions that we've been having, it's been very much a top-down approach. And in the spirit of what the 3CL does, we're very much moving for and advocating towards a bottom-up approach. Our plan today, a roadmap, to give us some structure, we've set some very high ambitions. We have about an hour and 10 minutes at this point. So. We really do want to uh, keep our conversations contained and focused. And the way in which we're going to do this is we're going to have a tripartite structure for this session. We're going to start out with who and my wonderful panel next to me here represents the stakeholders whom we would like to connect, build those bridges and have in mind, of course, Gen Z, whom we're trying to bring to the forefront. We're going to remind ourselves why we're here and build bridges between the different areas of society which do need to take action. <coughs> Education, we have the labour market, we need to think about the skill sets that we are preparing for, that we're recruiting for, that we're training for through lifelong learning structures. And of course, we need to think about research and development, the regulation, the moderation, our state of preparedness. If we are going to go forward with this middle ground in a thoughtful way, we need to think about the actions and the frameworks and structures we need in place. And the green light at the bottom, the what, is what we hope will come together to sketch out, at least in a first format this evening, through Slido, through a discussion, are some pigeon steps, shall we say, as these technologies continue to be developed at a very, very fast pace. What can we do in the present to get to that state of preparedness for the future? We're already underway, that's the good news. Uh, Chris and I have been working on a co-created research project with students from the School of Humanity, an online school offering these students self-selected into this research project which is what we think about learning and AI. And they joined us from across the world. I think we've got four continents represented here. And our research project has been framed within the context of rethinking a very restrictive version of education. To take the Cambridge Dictionary definition, the process of teaching or learning, especially in a school or college, or the knowledge that you get from this, how restrictive is that and how much change we need to push for. We've been thinking about developing best how to learn practices. My background is in the growing field of the learning sciences, the mushrooming group of disciplines, cognitive psychology, neuroscience, linguistics, and other areas that are coming together to really bridge the gap between the very important research and our growing understanding of how the brain works and bringing that to the forefront, the front lines of education and ensuring that both us and the next generation know how to best learn. And dare I say, in our current context with one of the, the greatest medical threats in terms of cognitive decline later in life, what better a tool and understanding could we possibly give one another? Thinking about our broader context, then we've also been thinking about thought leaders and deeper definitions of education. 
and we've taken our cue from Martin Luther King, who said this, the first function of education is to teach man to think intensively. And I think this gives us a, a really useful entrance point as we think about how AI tools and chat GPT don't spell the end of education, but perhaps the start of a reformed, a reimagined, uh, a revisited form of education. In our co-creation research group, which we're working on at the minute, and we will have a podcast series and tangible findings to share very, very soon, our question has been this, to think about AI and automation and learning, do that process of evaluation, it's been set up very much as a research project, and we have wanted to ask this answer this question, what is the best way to use AI for both teaching and learning? We have a hit list of benefits and disadvantages so far. We have identified collectively that there's huge aids in motivation, one of the key areas that we're all trying to triumph really in education, the intrinsic motivations, rather those in extrinsic factors through assessment. We've thought about the benefits of reminders and scheduling, the lowering of cost, the ease, the ability to bring a true form of personalized education, the way in which these tools are a time saver, the way in which they help with prioritization, the way in which they enable all of us to upskill, and I can uh, speak to that certainly, uh, having parachuted into another industry, that's another hat for another time. The way in which these tools help us diagnose a particular problem, the way in which they free up time, the way in which they're convenient, they're interactive. But of course there is the flip side. And the disadvantages are of course many. The dangers of spam, we've been talking about Duolingo and the sad owl telling you to go and do your language learning. We've been talking about ceilings to progression and uh, the need to just see these tools as a starting point and again to try and ground the debate in this idea that it's not spelling the end of education, but is actually a, uh, a stepping stone to something perhaps more meaningful. We've been talking about what other tools we need. We've been talking about the danger of these tools, encouraging us to be lazy, and thinking about those definitions of what it means to be an active learner, by which we mean being cognitively active rather than being task-driven activity danger of laziness and also this uh, important point that a lot of the uh, tools to date of course are text-based and what does that look like for inclusivity and equality and to finish up then on our hit list so far we've been talking about the need to have humans and thank goodness all of this starts with us and if we are to find this middle ground activist road through we need to be uh, prepared and to take action. And just to flag for us the how fast this is moving and how we are at this tipping point that Alex has been talking about just yesterday, Khan Academy released the beta version or uh, presented their AI assistant that can help with coding, identifying errors, that can explain to the student why they should care about what they're learning about. That can help with navigating next steps and going on to higher education. That can help craft a story. So it definitely is not spelling the end of a writing. And this is all built of ChatGPT4. That can help chat with a literary character, bring all these disciplines to life. Uh, that can help unpack an essay and rhetorical structures and identify good writing. That can also uh, help with teachers doing their teacher planning, a huge, huge time saver. And all of this was science fiction a year ago, and yet this is possible today. So with this sense of urgency in the background and um, the call from the students which we're whom we're working with, and um, Raffaella's uh, nod that we need to be speaking about this. I'd love to turn now uh, to my panel and come to this question of stakeholders. Perhaps, um, Gégé, if we can start over with you, the stakeholders you are in contact with and the challenges that they're uh, facing to start grounding our discussion. Thank you for that, Emma. Incidentally, the quote from Google's CEO um, was from 2018, not this year. Um, and the relevance of the date is that that particular comment about the importance of the technology happened when technology was at its very early stages of AI development. 
Can you imagine the significance of that quote with much stronger AI systems that we have today? I think the exponential curve at which the technology is growing is so huge that we often fail to understand um, where it's taking us. Okay, to your question on stakeholders. Um, so I'm a lawyer by profession, um, and I think I'm very interested in the regulatory undercurrents of technology. So I think our first stakeholder is um, the regulator, governing bodies, whoever those may be, it's perhaps something we could discuss, and those who are then regulated uh, by the impact of either legislation or ethical frameworks. Another set of stakeholders that I am commonly in touch with are people from the health tech community. So the organization which I serve as CEO um, is offering through AI the rebuilding of the interface between hospitals and patients. And there we see these two very vulnerable stakeholders. The first is the patient who wants access to a social good, a public good. But also we see an overworked workforce in healthcare that just can't meet the rising demands of today's population. And AI offering that mediation between these two stakeholders, almost saying, well, I can automate some of these processes. I can be the vector for positive social change, right? So that's... Uh, you know, another set of stakeholders, and perhaps researchers, right? So we work in the large language model industry by understanding and generating language. So we work with a lot of researchers who constantly ask these core questions. What is language? What is intelligence? What is consciousness? What is equity in the distribution of wealth from AI? And I think those are some really interesting questions. Thank you so much. You're point on equity, perhaps we can move on to Vanessa. How in, in your world, in your work, how is that question of equity and stakeholders, how does that uh, interact? Okay, so first of all, my background is in education. I have been in education for a number of years now. I also teach at the Faculty of ICT and I teach at the Department of AI. So we've been doing AI for quite some years now. And in particular, I'm very interested in the way AI affects education. So the sort of like stakeholders I'm in, in contact with, in touch with, are not just my own university students who are studying AI, but also those people who um, have some kind of um, uh, impact or influence from education. Okay, so um, I've got these, these two kinds of, of stakeholders. Now, with, with regards to equity, um, the idea of using a number of AI tools. You mentioned um, AI tools, okay, not just chat GPT. Chat GPT is, you know, it's the one that's making most noise at the moment. But we've been trying to research this whole idea of what sort of AI tools would best affect education for many years now. Um, I've known Alex for many years as well, and I, I remember that the first thing that we um, used to talk about was how to remove that kind of prescriptiveness of the curriculum that we have in education. And this is one way that we've always said AI could help. Some of the tools that are available in AI can help do that, um, to help bring out a certain creativity in people, in young people, in older people people in us as well. Um, so we can have um, tools that when it comes to equity, not everybody learns at the same rate. Not everybody wants to learn the same things. Not everyone is willing or able to take the same path and the same journey towards learning. By having an AI that is capable of actually going on this journey with you as a learner is something which is very, very important. And this is, I think, something that we need to work towards. Mm -hmm. But it has its downsides. I mean, I can speak about it and I can say, oh, this is fantastic and we can do it. In reality, it's very difficult to achieve. Um, when you said some students, um, you know, um, no, it was Alex, I think, who so mentioned that they switch off the cameras on, on Zoom, right? 
um, because they are afraid of, uh, of you know, showing their bedroom or because of privacy issues. In reality, for something of the sort to work, for AI to work properly in the way that I'm saying that it accompanies the learner on his journey so that this learning journey is equal for all, we need lots of lots of data data that belongs to the person, data that belongs to the learner, data that belongs to many people. And this is where, you know, AI is very, very data hungry. AI needs data to thrive. AI needs data to be this huge giant that it is. We are so happy with ChatGPT, but we don't know where it's getting its data from. All we know is that it's got a massive amount of data that nobody knows where, it, where it's coming from and what sort of data it uses. Now, having said that, if we don't have the right data, then we're, what we're going to create is a, is a personal assistant that may be biased, that may right. offer a learning journey that is not really good for everyone. So we really need to explore these things. We, we don't put a stop to them, no moratorium over there, but we really need to stop and think. We need to regulate, we need to ask questions, we need to properly see how it's going to impact. The potential is there, we really need to sit down and think how it will affect learners. Perfect, thank you so much, Vanessa. And I think what you've highlighted there is that we've got uh, a potential of, of bringing equity into education, but we're also highlighting at what cost. Um, the cost of building the models, the ingesting the data, um, impinging on copyrights, and we'll get to that um, very soon. Um, Joshua, over to you. How, how has this, uh, this debate about equity um, and the, uh, the costs of achieving equity through AI featured in your work? My interest comes from this whole argument um, and this whole movement of, let's say, AI, this recent hype, because of the regulation of AI. I was the chair of a regulator, and that's where my interest comes from, um, how to regulate AI. But then I'm a computer scientist who comes from a background of saying, no one tells me what to do with my code. So it's an interesting opposing aims that I have. And I would say, um, when it comes to a lot of the rhetoric that's being said about, it needs to be equitable, it needs to do this, it needs to do that, that's great. But can it actually be done? So if you speak to a lot of AI protocol designers or let's say algorithm designers working at the core, they will tell you it doesn't know what ethics is. I mean, you can build things around it to hide away what it's actually doing, but all it's doing is giving you the probabilities based on the past data. So I think it's great to have the principles in the right place to push them in that, that direction, but we also have to be realistic. Is it something that can be done? Thank you so much. I think that uh, brings us really nicely over to you, uh, Marisa. Forgive me for looking askance at you. I'm told I can't move my chair back, so I'm not out of uh, the picture. But on, on that note of practical steps and what this actually looks like on the ground, with your, with your um, background as a former president of the Malta Chamber, what are the ways in which we can really um, strategize for how AI manifests itself in the world of work, what employers are doing, what, what are the challenges that you're seeing in, in your world? I think the most important thing is that we look at it as a tool, not as some sort of mythological creature or monster or personality that can become greater than us. I think this is an important step because it determines how we relate to it, whether we approach it with fear or whether we approach it in a way where we question what can it do for us and what should the parameters be, what should the boundaries be, in a sense. Because when you think about it, it's been an evolution. Okay, it looks like with LGBT, we have kind of the, of the kind that we had with the smartphone in the late 90s, you know? It's, it's a horizontal thing that will uh, impact everyone, so we can't talk about stakeholders, it means everybody is a stakeholder, because it will affect everything. But I the fact is that it's, it's an evolution, so it's not creating new material effects. It's hashing, mashing together a lot of human creation, a lot of content that is, is there, uh, that was created by humans ultimately. We have to keep this in mind, that the intelligence part, <laughs> when it comes to AI, it seems to me it's like a fluid thing. So a few years back, uh, character recognition was AI. Today you take it for granted that when you stop your car in front of the, the boundary of a car park, the thing will open and you're out. And you don't think, ah, oh, AI anymore, you know? So it becomes normalized in, in, in the daily life. 
But I think a very, very important aspect of this is because now it has entered into the domain of language through ChatGPT. We, we must keep in mind that we have always been very particular about telling students in an educational context and even professionals in a, in a work context, mm -hmm. quote your sources. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this thing <coughs> called ChatGPT can come up with a very nicely written couple of paragraphs without quoting sources. And I think this is where regulation needs to start attacking, because if you're able to mesh together and put together and extract a lot of bits and pieces of information that are actually calibrated to the language used by the user usually, so that it sounds very much like something that he can relate to and all this, then you should be able to also quote the sources from where you're extracting the data. And I think this is, this is basic, acknowledging that the source is actually originally human. And, and, and therefore, the technology needs to be there to serve the human. That we continue focusing on this, especially then in in the work environment, where of course I think it can be very helpful, extremely helpful in enriching jobs. For example, a lot of job content is extremely boring. There's absolutely no intelligence in it. If you're doing the same thing all the time. It is what happened with automation in, in manufacturing. I mean, I come from manufacturing, so my examples tend to come from there. Automation has enriched jobs in the manufacturing industry. And AI, I believe, can enrich jobs, particularly in the service industry, where everything is a little bit more personalized, and the ability of AI to, to, to personalize and to customize and all this. So of course, there are, there are a lot of advantages. But the users, that is the people who are in the labor market, your employees, need to be able to appreciate what they're working with, need to have much sharper judgment than they have today. Now today, we're not working with AI tools, but whoever employs people will tell you the biggest challenge is judgment. People are unable to decide what is important, what is not, what is relevant and what is not, how to prioritize. And I doubt that AI will be able to do that for us, especially if it is geared to tell us what it thinks we want to hear. Perfect. And that moves us very nicely on to our education section. And as you're saying, Marisa, it's a, really a, this question of um, literacies. And if I can nod to Howard Rheingold's uh, Net Smart uh, book from 2014 and this comment that he makes, we're in a period where the cutting edge of change has moved from the technology to the literacies made possible by uh, the technology and how true that is. Um, today, but as you're highlighting, it's not just about the literacies made possible, but indeed the literacies that we need to uh, be able to function alongside AI to open up those opportunities to return to uh, levels of human creativity. Just thinking about uh, our context for education and the polarization of the, the debate um, and also the concerns that come along with this. So we've talked about some of the, the, the benefits um, here already. Um, this red flag really from Toby Walsh, the chief scientist of the University of New South Wales, the AI Institute, says this, when it comes to any digital data you see, audio or video, you have to entertain the idea that someone has spoofed it. So this idea of human judgment coming in, um, how to judge a source, it is uh, critical uh, literacy, which is uh, where uh, my work um, sat and where, uh, what we really need to push and we often talk about as 21st century education. And my goodness, don't we need a form of 21st century education more than ever now? As we move towards the um, middle ground, we have this from Salman Khan as he was presenting the beta version of Khan Migo. He said this, if we put the right guardrails, we do the right things, we are at the cusp of using AI for probably the biggest positive transformation that education has ever seen. Just before this panel started, we talked about how big the questions are that we're asking and how challenging it's going to be in the space of 40 minutes to come up with a fully actionable um, strategy plan to target all of these areas. But what are the, um, the pigeon steps, shall we say, but impactful pigeon steps that we can take to steer that cruise ship of education? Um, Jeje, may I start with you? What do you think? Well, here's what we need before regulation. It's literacy, right? Um, we cannot go on a regulatory crusade unless we have a citizen uh, population which understands what we run about. And I think one of the biggest difficulties that we have in AI at the minute is that it's surrounded by hype. 
often you know state sponsored hype because there is an advantage in economic positioning for a country but we also have commercial hype and i think the problem there is that it moves the difficult discussion about ethics about equality about distribution of wealth towards hype and marketing speak and i think that's despicable so my first action point would be let's ensure we've got a good literacy framework okay how do we do that well I've got a four-year-old son. His name is Gigi. And they've started off um, nutrition classes in school where they help young kids aged four distinguish between protein and carbs. And I think that's absolutely great. I wish I had that education. I'd be 20 kilos less if I did. <laughs> but maybe now we need to parallelize information about digital digest. How do you understand what sponsored content is versus authoritative content. I think that we've got you know, people getting now to bachelor's degree thesis writing, which still don't understand the basic differentiation of source, authorship, credibility. And that brings us to perhaps another actionable point, which is trust. Right? So I don't think that society can trust AI because it is computationally better because it could write better prose in you know, GPT-4 or 5 or 6. But I think we trust technology when we understand that it is aligned to the human values that we deem fit for our society. So perhaps the interesting part of a discussion like that which we have today is that technology is a mirror to the human self, right? And the more we discover elements of technology, and ask ourselves, but what is logic? What is rhetoric? What is truth? What is consciousness? We're just digging deeper into understanding what humanity is about. And there's this lovely book which talks about the danger and joy of metaphors. And it says the common metaphor which we use today, which is comparing human intelligence with computational intelligence. Of course, there's a, a, a large scene between the two. The danger is that we project human capabilities onto artificial intelligence and vice versa, bring artificial capabilities into human thinking. And I think that's the danger in us trying to create clarity around trust. For me, trust in AI means we need ethical technology, we need lawful technology that follows at the minimum the regulatory environment around privacy, safety and so on. You need robust technology. And I think perhaps the key word for me, which is actionable, is interpretability. I agree with Josh. AI is today too complex to expect full explainability. I mean, do you understand exactly how your microwave is cooking your food and why your chicken is now 50 degrees? No, you don't, right? None of us do. And it's okay. We don't need to have a level of explainability to use certain tools. But I think interpretability is required. And interpretability means that we can understand the relationship between cause and effect of the technology which we bring into society. Because when we do that, we cannot box technology and forget about it. Right? When we brought internet, when we brought social media into the world, it changed lives. It changed the way we think, the way we study, the way we live, the way we form human relationships. So as we bring this next wave of technology, we need to make sure it is trusted, it is aligned, and it is received in a population which has a significant level of literacy that can bring the positive aspects of that technology to the fore. Superb, thank you. And as someone who's got that huge depth of uh, AI literacy, if, for want of a better term, that we had all hoped to, um, to have, what are the missing elements, the building blocks of the literacy, the understanding that we need to have to get to that point, as Jeje outlined, to um, have at least that foundational understanding to be able to interact with AI and have that human judgment, as Marisa was saying, in our workplace? So I wouldn't bother worrying about the IT students. Everything is perfectly covered for them. Um, what we should worry about is the population at large, excluding the, the IT um, tech um, literate or, or more um, savvy. Um, if we were to start at a young age, which we should, um, that's great. But until our young individuals become part of society, start paying taxes, our adults can vote, that's going to take 10, 20 odd years. So we need a multi-pronged approach where we're not only educating our kids, but we're also coming up with literacy programs 
for the population at large. And I say, say this just like it's something we can do. It's not easy to do. I mean, how do you go about doing that? Um, online webinars, you get people to come to a few. Um, so I, I think that is the actual challenge, a pragmatic way of educating the population. I don't have an answer to that. I think we've got um, a good action point. So if anyone would like to respond to that and has some ideas, I think that mo definitely moves us um, ahead of unpacking this idea of literacy is an area that I've been working on with Alex through various CPD programmes and otherwise, digital literacies, AI literacies. Um, Marisa, from, from your point of view, if we're going to be able to excise human, uh, this human judgment element in um, a workplace setting, something that work the employers are really concerned about, how are we going to upskill those who are already in the workplace? What's the, what is that actionable um, moment? What can we do? Upskilling is one of the biggest challenges nowadays, particularly locally, because of the high rate of turnover that we have at the workplace. And one of the things that during my two years at the chamber, I really tried hard to push forward don't train your employees for yourself. Train them for the market. Because if we're going to keep training people for as long as we believe that they will still be working with us tomorrow, we will train no one. <laughs> because the volatility on the labor market is so high that he, to, be, to be comfortable as an employer, to be able to sleep well, you have to accept that your employees are with you for as long as they are, and that may be only till tomorrow. But the need to invest in upskilling with um, your employees is also a process of learning as an organization. Because what they create while they're with you, the relationships they build on the job, and the way they deal with your customers, and your customers tend to have a little bit more of a longer time with you nowadays than your employers typically. They are your employees. That is extremely important. I think as businesses, we need to acknowledge that in a changing world, we have a very big role in terms of, let's call it education. Also, why? Because a lot of people leave formal schooling at a certain age and unfortunately do not return. And through employment, or through dealing with businesses as customers, there is a very good window of opportunity to train. Think, for example, of all those people who are over 65, so definitely out of the labor market. How are you going to reach those people when it comes to technology? Probably one of the easiest ways is through the bank, because the bank is an important part of their life for the rest of their life. So I think as businesses, we, we need to understand this, that to have a market that values what we are putting on the market, we need to invest in the education of our employees, no matter for how long they'll be with us, and also of the customers and suppliers that we deal with. Thank you so much. I think that again pinpoints the need for this holistic uh, global view and we've highlighted the need to think about the um, interconnectedness of education and the labour market and as we've been reminded um, and as Jeje and all of our panellists have highlighted um, none of us can bury our heads in the sand every product of every company is what will be impacted um, by the quick development of AI to move us into our uh, next section, I'd like to um, give a case study. I mentioned that I wear another hat. I also work in the record industry. I run a classical record label. And the music industry is one that is facing the challenge of gen generative AI with the same sort of fear that it faced when we had another wave of digital transformation with the rise of streaming sites, such as um, Spotify. And we have the majors, the big, uh, players in the field doing exactly the same that they did back in the early 2000s. We have Universal Music Group, which is calling for an end to any further development. On the other side, we have a whole range of products being uh, developed to ease the business of music, which is recording, producing, uh, releasing. We have tools such as uh, TubeBuddy, which can help um, create content. And we also have um, the whole number of ChatGPT uh, prompts that are focused in the industry. 
The people that I've spoken to within this uh, sector have again uh, really um, been mirrors of this polarised debate. On the one hand there's a whole fear of what they can do and they want to put their heads in the sand and on the other side there's those who want to forge ahead thoughtlessly um, shall we say, without much regard, because there's a fear that if you don't keep developing, uh, you're going to um, miss the boat. To come back to our nautical um, analogies. We've been talking about um, skill sets, and that's been really at the forefront of my mind as I've been having these conversations with colleagues across the music industry of all ages. And it has really brought me back to this question that we've already been touching upon, this idea of literacies, um, what uh, kind of understanding, um, what um, practical knowledge, if we understand skill as a practical application of knowledge, we all need. Um, Vanessa, um, as you're working with students in a higher education setting, and they, uh, they might go on to the creative industries, <laughs> which in the, the, the UK are certainly celebrated, they might go on to all other industries also, all impacted by AI. What sort of skill sets should we be uh, preparing our students for, no matter what course, what programme of study they are? Okay, I'm currently in an EU-funded project, and this project deals with the upskilling of language and linguistic students. So the language students and the linguistic student of five years ago is not the same student as is now. The job requirements have evolved and they have changed. I don't know who mentioned, but all these jobs are changing um, with the technology. They're enriching the jobs. Now, um, our role in the project is to see what's happening on the market, to see how technology is impacting these group of people, and to propose ways in which when they're studying they can you know get their skilling to be better prepared for the market so the job of the language specialist and the linguistic person has evolved to incorporate and include ai so we need to offer these people with skills that are related to natural language processing to machine learning that are all parts of ai technologies so um, this is one way at a younger level as jojo was saying we need skills with the way they are supposed to think Okay, or the way people should think to be critical. You mentioned that, and even Marisa said, you know, um, tools such as ChatGPT can give you, um, you know, a bit of text. Uh, most of it will probably be completely untrue, not fa non factual, okay? It will be a kind of a hallucination. But we have to teach our students, our people, whoever, not necessarily students, not to take everything at, at face value. So I think that is one important skill set that they need to carry with them. And how this is done, it's not necessarily done by sitting in front of the computer. You know, there are various ways of teaching um, these new skill sets, uh, maybe through discussion, through thinking, getting them to think, through using tools, but in an alternative way. Um, we have also um, published a book at our department, and it is aimed to introduce concepts of AI to young people, even young children, and to help teachers to try and understand what sort of concepts of AI we're trying to teach. Now, um, this is very limited, it's just one book, ten sections basically, um, dealing with some basic concepts in AI. Okay, so if we talk about ChatGPT, ChatGPT is based on neural networks. So what are neural networks? People may not be interested in the real workings of a neural network, but if they understand the basic concept of what is behind it, and we don't even use programming or coding for that. You know, we use these activities that have bits and pieces and paper and cups and stuff like that. And we understand where all, you know, the, the way ChatGPT is actually working out, then we are more aware of what it can do, of its capabilities, of how it can really impact. So these are the sort of skill sets that we, we need to identify the audience, we need to identify what we are preparing them for, and then build towards it. When it comes to teachers, they also need these skill sets. I know and I know and I know that teachers are completely overloaded. I know that teachers are, are always given things, you know, like 
this is what you need to do, okay, so go ahead and do it. But if there's the right approach to skilling, to upskilling teachers in, in, you know, in the world that we're living in today, I think that is also an important step forward because it's not just you know, the young children, it's also the teachers who are teaching the young children. Superb. So I think what we're getting at here is the, the what, what are the literacies, um, unpacking that, and we've already done um, a lot of work here. And I think what you've really highlighted there, Vanessa, is our need to rethink what core education is. Um, three R's it was what we originally thought we needed to deliver, reading, writing and arithmetic. Well, how do we cut across um, and how do we embed that? at every stage of education. We've been circling around the question of regulation, moderation, um, and our state of preparedness already by unpacking these literacies and, and how we deliver them um, and develop them. Don't need to um, highlight the, the, the fear that is really embedded across the AI community, but also others um, involved in the development. Here's a statement from Jeffrey Hinton, the so-called godfather of AI, who's um, thrown in his job at Google because he's so fearful of what AI might become. And uh, he says, quite scary on the dangers of chatbots. And if we are to move to a state of regulation, a moderation, an environment in which we are controlling the development of these technologies, then we need to think about the regulators and their understanding, their lit level of literacy. Before this session uh, today, Alex and I were uh, talking about the uh, Facebook um, and when Mark Zuckerberg was hauled up in front of the Senate um, to unpack and explain himself as to how um, Facebook's algorithms had been working and it became very quickly apparent that the senators who were questioning him didn't fully understand how the internet worked which is a, a little bit of um, a failing point if you're going to try and regulate and this has repeated itself we've seen history repeat itself and this has happened with TikTok also so here's the question then if we have people at the top of the US government who are seeking to impo impose controls and they themselves don't understand what they are dealing with, are we developing too fast with too little understanding? Um, Zhejie, perhaps I can gesture to you to uh, respond to this before we um, open up and um, review strategies and think how we move towards um, action points. From your standpoint as someone who's uh, an entrepreneur in the space running um, a business, what are your thoughts? I would certainly not use the American Senate as a model of <laughs> uh, democratic <Indeed>. due process <laughs> uh, or perhaps, uh, you know, capability. But, you know, okay, jibe apart. Um, of course, yes, uh, we do need uh, regulation and we need regulation to mitigate risk. Right? That's what regulation is for. And AI, just like any other type of technology, does pose risks. Risks which relate to discrimination, risks which relate to loss of privacy, risks which relate to inequality or market disruptions. So of course we need uh, regulation, and of course we need regulators who are themselves educated in understanding what the process is to create such regulatory activity. In general, the key option that every state has is that between overregulation and no regulation. The balance obviously is somewhere in between. But what's in the center of that delicate balance is innovation. Because we know over the centuries that when we overregulate a specific market, we stifle the capability for innovative and creative process. So it's a very delicate and not particularly easy balance for a state to strike. But perhaps one idea or action point could be this. My thoughts would be around regulating not the science, not the math behind AI, but rather regulating the specific use cases that do require risk management. So, for example, if the organization I serve is producing healthcare AI technology, I would expect that before the technology is deployed in a live environment, there is a regulatory framework which would allow that technology to be certified or otherwise made available. But in other areas where there is low risk, low risk to human life, 
or uh, other forms of risk that you perhaps do not need to regulate that specific use case. Alternatively, if you have traditional legislation which is sufficient in regulating that use case, you don't need to enact new AI-driven regulations. So here's an example. One of the most common use of AI technology in Malta is Maltese companies that use these very simple AI tools to sift through inbound CVs. So you're recruiting an engineer, you've got 60 applications, if you're lucky, Marisa might have had the opposite. And you need to sift through those 60 to ultimately meet the top five candidates. And you use a basic AI application, which is sifting through these uh, CVs itself rather than yourself. Now, in that specific sector, that area in the labor market is so well regulated, we have so much uh, history in regulating anti-discriminatory activities in selection and recruitment, that probably we do not need specific regulation which is tackling the AI angle, because being a tool which is ultimately reaching a particular end, the selection process and the simplification thereof, perhaps additional regulation is unnecessary. But let's perhaps circle back to this whole concept of work and employability, because I think a lot of these questions around uh, regulation stem from this. I think employability is less about what you know and what you've learned at university, and it's more about your ability to adapt and change over time. And maybe that is ultimately the most important function of education, no? the ability to help us to find and solve interesting problems, right? And I think that's the creative genesis that is really defining work. Perhaps what AI can do is rehumanize work. Why? Because we now have a tool set which can remove the repetitive, boring, almost inhuman activities, tasks within a job and move them onto a robotic activity and instead allow the human worker to really rediscover the meaning of the job. I qualified as a lawyer 20 years ago, and most of the work young lawyers did then and still do now is repetitive, rule-based contract drafting. I mean, why should you give that to a lawyer? I think that an AI tool can do it equally well. But allow that young lawyer to discover the meaning of fairness, of ethics, of fixing things, that really gives back meaning. And that is where I think our regulatory environment, your question, should be creating this ecosystem in which it allows businesses and employees to rediscover meaning. And I think that is the ultimate value that we have using these tools. Thank you so much. And you've beautifully woven together our, our three themes. And um, thank you to all of our um, panel. We've, I think, really underlined the need to have an interconnected um, approach, uh, think across uh, disciplines. And, and thank you, Jeje, for highlighting the need to think on a case-by-case -case basis. There's been much discussion about the question of accuracy of AI tools and the situations in which that accuracy might matter. It matters if you get a health diagnosis incorrect. That 5-10% margin of error really, really matters. Um, does it matter if you quoted the wrong source or the wrong sources put forward? That's a, a, a different user case, right? So we, we do have to think more on a detailed, granular um, level. And, and thank you so much to the panel to, uh, for really um, grounding our discussion and um, bringing it um, to that worm's eye view, right, of what we can do from the ground up. And thinking of uh, positive use cases, Jeje, as you were um, gesturing to, I think we've already started moving towards this middle ground um, activist uh, stance that we hope that we can really push forward today um, as we move to take your questions and observations and respond to them in just a second. This is what Salman Khan uh, said at the end of his talk of the, uh, the Khan Amigo, and uh, forgive me for continuing to refer back, but I was uh, really um, bowled over, to be honest, by this uh, fast development, having spent the past two years trying to develop an AI tutor myself, and suddenly these uh, science fiction situations have become this reality. And, and perhaps he um, encourages us to take this middle ground in this way. 
He says this, I think all of us together have to fight like hell to make sure that we put the guardrails, we put in, when the problems arise, reasonable regulations, going back to what you were saying, Zhezhe, about it being grounded, thinking about the particular use case. And we fight like hell for positive use cases. And previous to this, he's talked about the danger of stopping the development of AI. Remember that we're not all good actors in this world, unfortunately. If the good actors stop, others will continue. And he talks about how very close this is to his heart. And as he says, obviously, there's many potential positive use cases, but perhaps the most po powerful use case and perhaps the most poetic use case is if AI, artificial intelligence, can be used to enhance human intelligence, HI, <laughs> human potential and human purpose, as we've all been gesturing to, to and as you've reminded us, um, Zhezhe. Uh, I'd like to um, give a, a, a warm thanks to the panel so far uh, for a really uh, useful discussion and I'd love now to turn to observations and, and uh, questions. Alex, what have we got? Um, so I don't far. know to try and pivot that at the slide. There's been very little, actually, in terms ah. of... Uh, Questions, but I, I don't know if I sure. can pivot and find the screen. Yeah, sure. Um, Was, is, are there any um, observations I mean, probably just from the floor? Some people want to yeah. ask questions from the yeah. floor before we go into Absolutely, this. please. Sorry, yeah, if I may. Please. Um, I think there was a, an element of saying it's hype. I think it's much more than hype. I think one of the evidence of it being much more than hype is not that it's Sorry, it's not that it's displacing people, it's displacing businesses. I mean, Czech, their share price dropped by 50% last night. Duolingo was down by 25% at one point. I know two extremely well-funded, high-quality ed techs, which, one in London, one in Sydney, closed their doors in the last two weeks because their products, which were beautiful, the marginal cost of delivering that and delivering it better is no zero because of chat GPT. So there's going to be a technical bloodbath. There's going to be a business bloodbath. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a question to Joshua, putting your blockchain hat on. But I, I really enjoyed reading this uh, when I came in. One of the questions, thing that focuses all the time on is truth. Truth is really about the origination. But if you're the person who created that, then that is the truth. You did it. And this is where we come into the immutability of the blockchain and the distributed ledger. And I wonder whether in fact AI and cryptography is going to create a user case for blockchain because that will be the way that we will no longer be worried about whether this is for real because you could use the disputed ledger to actually immutably say, yes, it is real. Indeed, I agree that it's not just hype, starting with that. This is going to change society and there's going to be a bloodbath and lots of change. But coming back to um, blockchain, um, what the blockchain is good at is recording something forever that's unchangeable. The moment it's been put in, it can't be changed. However, at the same time, garbage in, garbage out. Um, once we have EIDs and certain types of user credentials, or actually even our, our logins, we can prove forever that we said something and no one changed it. So yes, it does provide a solution to truth. It does, AI does create another use case for blockchain, but ultimately, the main problem is how do we figure out that who said what. If we have the blockchain, we can confirm that forever. But will people look towards that? Will people look towards the references, towards the citations, and say, I trust Joshua, therefore, I know he said it, and it must be trustworthy. So I still think one of the ch biggest challenges that we have is how do we educate people to take in that information, digest it, and just have some discernment. Because it's not, we, we talk about truth. But often, there is no black or white, often it's somewhere in between as well. So for me, that's one of the biggest takeaways here. Um, how do we come up with a population that is better suited to digest information and um, act upon that information? Can I build on that and um, perhaps address the, the question about hype? Um, 
I think this technology is going to be the next big leveler um, in the world. Um, I'm, I'm quite certain that we're going to see this on a national level uh, and also on a citizen level. First of all, on a, on a national level, we are going to see this big separation between those countries which have the economic, educational and skills capabilities to run with AI to improve processes, competitiveness and the economy, and those who don't. And those who will be left behind, not in 10 years' time, but in three years' time, are going to feel like quasi-medieval states mm -hmm. with poor economic outcomes and poor healthcare outcomes. But I think we also need to understand the geopolitics of this, right? In the same way that to understand the geopolitics of the 20th century, you'd need to understand the oil economy to understand the stories and narratives of today, of the 21st century, you need to understand semiconductors and silicon, which is the core technology used to train our AI models, which is why the biggest tension between America and China is mounting on Taiwan, which is the single largest producer of silicon chips used in our NVIDIA GPU technology, which we use to train our AI models. But this big leveler is not simply happening at a state level, it's also happening at citizen level, right? I think one of the best books about this is Professor Shoshana Zuboff's book, right? Who says that we are dividing society into two big components. The 99% us that are observed, whose data is ripped for training, and the 1% often consolidated in California, who are the observers, who are using that model, who are using that data to create a new market of human futures. So this is not hype. This is the next social stratification that we need to be concerned about and that we need to shape in an ethical way. If I can just build up also on what um, Joshua was saying and your question as well, and also to tie in with JJ. Um, so AI, the way it is right now, is a driving force. Be it hype or not, it's a driving force. If a business is not able to adapt, and match up to, with the speed it is evolving, then it's going to be out of business. So the businesses have to continuously reimagine themselves. They need to come up with this uh, solution to how they're going to remain competitive in light of what's coming out. But speaking about equity and speaking about these big tech giants that have all the resources and all the all the all the capabilities of pushing forward at this very advanced rate of development. At an EU level, as Europeans, we do not have the power that these big tech giants have in America. Okay? We don't have the resources yet. We are regulated by frameworks that the US have no clue okay, about. So, so, so there are these you know, two sides of things. And in relation to maybe a question about blockchain, um, to build upon it, um, we need trust, Joshua said trust, but how can you trust something you don't know where the data is coming from? I keep, I keep pitching on about the data, but if we take chat GPT, it's a black box, okay? We can't really trust something, we can't build our trust if we don't know how it works. And the big tech giants are not going to tell us, they're not going to reveal to us. It, it happened also with something like DALI which was a sort of like precursor to, to, to ChatGPT from the artistic perspective, from the image. We hadn't yet recovered from Dali and how it comes ChatGPT, you know, even though uh, GPT models have, lot, have been long in coming, okay, it didn't, it didn't just, you know, um, come up in December, there's a whole history to it. But with, with Dali, okay, um, we had this, this tool, okay, where a person would enter a prompt, a text, and Dali would create a work of art from scratch, novel, okay? And you, wouldn't, you would never have seen it. But the thing is that Dali, as an algorithm, learned how to create these artistic representations, these works of art, from somewhere. We don't know where. It could have scraped things off, you know, from artists who are completely oblivious you know, that Dali was using their work of art to learn more about art. So can I trust these algorithms? You know? so that's a matter of trust. And this is, you know, where we really need to, to dig in and, and think about. Superb, yes, please.
really, really interesting. And I am not an AI person at all. Um, we should start with that. Although I find it exciting. Um, but it, it's not happening in a vacuum. Um, AI is happening within a neoliberal agenda. When we talk about nation states, nation states have agendas. And when we keep referring to human beings as citizens, well, if you just look at this country, three quarters of the population, what is the percentage of our workers that are not citizens? One third. One third. One third of in our- In the private sector. In the private sector, one third of our workers aren't citizens. So our regular, so it's not AI that scares me, it's human beings that scare me. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about enhancing human beings, I get shit scared by the implications of this. And I think, so if we're gonna ask ourselves what is the role of the education system beyond these technical skills and the needs of the market, it's the ethical questions and, and how and who is framing these ethical questions. Because if we're thinking about things from a neoliberal perspective, I, I didn't mention climate change, <laughs> and, and we might be all, all be dead by the time we reach singularity. Um, not everyone is in, being included in the human, so not everyone is going to be benefiting from these fundamental basic human rights that we keep taking for granted, like access to education, and access to healthcare, and the benefits of AI, when so many people aren't benefiting from that in the first That's why place. it's so complex. It's why it's so complex. It's why there are so many people quitting jobs and AI ethics, and it's why there's a huge turnover of ethicists, <laughs> because it's a very, very complex question. And it also it's back to basics as, mm -hmm. as well, and I think perhaps within the education system we forgot the basics. Mm -hmm. The voice you just yeah. heard, okay, we are here because of Joe Kauke, by the way, <laughs> okay, who, who very loudly told me over the phone about three months ago, okay, when we, I first talked about the chat GPT, and Joe told me, just get a workshop done, get a whole bunch of educators, maybe get some people on there, because it's going to change everything, okay, so that was Joe mumbling in the background, okay. What I would add on to this point is um, very often I say don't worry about AI. And what I mean when I say that is AI as this individual entity that might take over the world. It's, we're not close to it. It doesn't seem like we've made a quantum leap towards that. But what we should worry about is human intelligence that we have with us right now. And we have certain individuals, entities, countries, whatever, that might use this technology to the bad. So don't worry about AI going off a rogue. Let's worry about individuals using this technology right now. Absolutely. But that means you're now getting into the political sphere in terms of ideologies. So if we're living in a neoliberal society, and what does that mean? What does that imply in terms of the power of private entities to control they already do. They already do. But it will become much, much worse. Another way of um, I'm interested in is inclusion. And I'm talking about total inclusion. For example, in order to use chat GPT in Malta, you have to have English. So many kids don't even have that. What are we doing to to, to, to teach even the basic literacies before we even talk about these higher form of literacies. Teachers are an intrinsically conservative lot. They do not want change. They fear change. I started teaching 50 years ago. And 50 years ago, I heard the phrase, we must not change teams, and they are still here today. No, that, uh, thank you so much for bringing us to the question of Malta and how we try and steer this cruise ship to go to the beginning of uh, how Alex set us up. Before we move to sort of concluding comments, I wonder if we can think of some um, local strategies, um, uh, as Joe's highlighted. I think Malta's not the only place in which perhaps the education system might uh, 
fight back against change. Um, are there any other educators in the audience who perhaps could uh, come forward with some strategy? Yes, please. Uh, look, when, when the help of the internet came in the 1990s, <coughs> everybody was talking about this big challenge. Come the Web2 technologies, again, um, we're going on about, and somehow, in education, we managed to resist <laughs> <laughs> in our own ways. Come AI, and again, we're talking about riding the wave, the tsunami coming, um, and you were saying about humans and being afraid of humans and being afraid of the creativity of humans, that somehow we find ways of going on in our own ways. Uh, no, only time will tell. Um, so I don't have any answers. But I, I think it's because the, the old ways are regulated. When you think about it, you are free to do whatever you can in life, but what you do between 4 and 16 is not optional. Yes, absolutely. And I would say between 1 and 5, which are the critical years. I mean, the most important instinct in the human, in human beings is the curiosity. Yes. But in our, not just in more, most of the time, most people that are generalizing stiffen that curiosity instinct before the kids even go to school. And that is what distinguishes those who succeed in education with an inverted commas and those who don't. How are we going to change the social structures, the social perceptions of I think the majority. A huge challenge for which, if, if I may bring us to concluding points, uh, unless th there's something you'd like to add, if you'd like to respond. It's a big ontological question yeah. of mindsets. Quite. And worldviews, because I have seen younger people who are struggling with this problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, we don't want to jump on the land card wagon. At the same time, um, we're talking about not um, being conservative or not staying behind and needing to be literate and needing um, AI skills uh, in the world that it's developing in order to remain effective and relevant. Um, so, how do they? Thank you. And if I can use that as my jump off point to ask each of our panellists in a few sentences to set the challenge, what change? We've got huge challenges ahead of us. Um, we know that there's a huge mindset problem. We know that we're fighting against um, heavily entrenched systems. Um, what small actionable change do you think we can together affect and push forward uh, in the immediate future in the next uh, six months? Um, Jeje, over to you first. I'd like to take a page out of Joe's book, which I think is that we need to ensure that this does not become a technical debate, but it becomes a political debate. And if you are under the guise that this is a discussion about artificial intelligence, then you're long. We will have more leverage if we understand that ultimately this is about politics, this is about coordination, and this is about alignment and leverage. And if we can move society to understand that AI is a matter of politics first and technology second, I think that would be a, a great step forward. That's perhaps just a, a point to Joe. But to your question, Emma, I think that if there are two things I would advocate for now in our debate, I think we need to start thinking properly about the distribution of wealth that AI creates. I think it would be wrong if we redo what we did in the oil economy, where we had a concentration of power and wealth and a huge inequality of income. I think we can't do that mistake again as a country, also as a planet, and we need to start thinking now about new models uh, in wealth distribution. And perhaps on a local level, what I would advocate is for a debate to start around universal basic income. If we are going to state 
that AI is a debate about politics, that job displacement, displacement is likely, and the educational system is going to be too slow to react, then we need a new model of compensation which ensures that there's a social solidarity net whereby no one is left behind. And we've avoided that discussion for 30 years. I don't think we can avoid it for another three. Thank you so much. Vanessa? At the cost of adding on to rhetoric, education is indeed key, but not the kind of curricular education or the education that is found in schools. It's education for all. Everybody needs to be aware. You said pigeon steps. Some kind of awareness programs, just you said, it's a very complex thing, but I don't have the answer for it. I, I don't know. There are very ways in which the general society out there can be reached. So not just children, but all the way up, everybody who is going to be impacted by AI at every level, uh, not just even academic level. Um, people need to be aware so that they can have a better judgment of how to behave, how to act, how to react, and what, what their rights really are, and what their duties are, and what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Joshua. Yeah, so to hark on the same path, um, I would say let's start with education across the board at all ages. Um, one, in regards to, well, more for the younger years, um, to have a more, I guess, ethics-driven approach to what is it that we want to achieve rather than the subject. Um, help individuals find what they love doing and what they're good at doing and go down that path. I think if we start there, then we can get rid of, of a lot of the other problems that emerge from ethical behavior. Um, now, building on that, um, there is going to be a bloodbath. There is going to be a change of society because of AI. And I think we need to prepare society for this potential change by creating other types of educational offerings for companies, for government, for everything. Thank you very much. Marisa. I pick on the comment that education has resisted so many waves of technological change. I'm not sure if it's education that has resisted or the rest of society that is increasingly leaving education out of the equation because it's finding that it's easier to get things done that way. So the resistance is putting at least the formal education, driving it into irrelevance. And I think this is a moment where educators, particularly those in formal education system, need to realize that they are at the crossroads. That if they continue to resist, the irrelevance will become irreversible. Mm. When you look at adults today who are successful, you will find that most of what they've learned and is useful to them today, they did not learn at school. Now, as a society, we invest a lot, a lot of resources in formal education. For how long can we continue to afford to do this without clear purpose at this point? Without relevance. <laughs> without, and it needs to come from the educators themselves, I believe. Change has to come from within. And just like within industries, we've said, forget about certain kind of qualifications. Let's go for micro-credentials because it's quicker, more relevant, closer to the innovation. It, it, it builds the confidence of people much better. I think this needs to start even in the formal schooling setup where educators deliberately deviate <laughs> from what is standard teaching only to find out at the end of the year that what they were supposed to teach and chose not to, their students now know already. Thank you so much. And if I can uh, take, the, um, take the mantle and from my point, I guess I should give my two penneth as well, having put everybody on the spot just here. So um, to speak from a very uh, a, a personal experience myself, I parachuted into an industry that I had absolutely no idea how it worked in terms of music copyright, the business of music. And going to what, you, uh, what we've been saying on, on the panel, my PhD in early modern French travel and identity did not prepare me to navigate uh, music copyright, you won't be surprised to hear. And that has only really made me want to redouble my efforts going to the questions that we've been asking in terms of what 
should education deliver? How do we open mindsets? Um, and the question to all of us as we move ahead to concluding comments, think about that middle ground activism that we hope we can inhabit with you. Should we not be opening young minds as early as possible to go back to what Joe's been reminding us of to the need to know how we learn and be ready for that moment. At the moment, it's, it's the commodification of AI technologies in the future, who knows what will come next? And it will only be those, the winners will be those whose minds are open and they're ready to adapt, change, and uh, be part of that steering of that ship. A uh, huge thanks to everyone, um, from myself and to the panel. As predicted, uh, we've come quickly up to uh, time, and I think what we've highlighted is that we will need to have a part two, and hopefully this is the start of a bigger discussion. Without further ado, over to Alex. Do you guys realize we've been doing education here? This is education. This is it. We'll share the slides. The way we normally share information at the 3 cl we'll put it online. You can download it under a Creative Commons license. Um, I'm hoping that us having got you here is not two hours of entertainment. And I'll give you examples. Um, last November, we, we got a whole bunch of people through the all around the world. We got some money from somewhere to talk about how young people are navigating information. So, so what do you have under your bums, if you still have them there? The, the way this was created, I'm, I'm kind of holding it up as if it's some sort of Bible, it isn't. The process was, we recorded a conference. We then got two young people, two of them are standing there. So Alex there was one of the victims. So I got Alex to scrape, you heard the word scrape, scrape content from what people like these guys were saying. But they also scraped what people were saying on Sligo. So what you have said on Sligo, is not going to go to waste. That, ironically for us, was data. We then looked at the whole approach. I'm 61 years old, going on to 62. I have a son who's studying at Oxford at the moment. But I'm still scared that he's studying history and politics. That he might not have the basic skill sets that he needs to navigate life. In Maltese, we call it a horrible word, ilhazen. I look at it from the positive point of view, identifying opportunities, which is what these guys have been on about now. What you will find here are ideas scraped from what young people observed, because we also have systems where we never encourage learners to speak out. I distinctly remember, I think when I was six or seven, I think I was banned by mentioning the word politics. I was kicked out of class. I think it was the first time I was kicked out of class. <laughs> So we don't encourage critical thinking. I'm here. As I was here, somebody pinged me from Sweden, from the Research Institute of Sweden. The way I've been looking at this is what we learn in Malta can actually also be transported to Sweden to other places. I have somebody from the UK saying, they looked at this, they contributed to this. And said, we'll try and make this work somewhere else. It might work in a village hall. It might work. I always have advocated we need digital literacies in the home, in the boardroom, and the classroom. We're far away from that at the moment. I'm not here to preach. I'm here as somebody who's the father of a brilliant 21-year-old. But just because he might get a first class from Oxford doesn't mean that he will be able to navigate life. And as he tells me, he's always telling me, Dad, I come from a generation, Generation Z, that I'm scared of going out sometimes because somebody might film me, somebody might record me. You guys might record my voice now. Very soon you can put words into my mouth mm. which I never said. So that's the bad stuff. The good stuff is that my dad who has early signs of dementia. Maybe we can record my voice. He can talk to me even when I'm not there. That's the other side of what we can do. Okay? Mm. So this yin and yang, I think, looking at the dark stuff and the light, I think is where we need to go. So if you have some time, whatever you end up doing with this, and it's not just the print, it's be online, we're going to send this to annoy everybody. By the way, at our conference, the OSCE turned up. The Council of Europe turned up. I got involved with it because the OSCE told me, okay, or I heard, we've got this whole thing about the freedom of media. 
we are going to go and regulate social media the same way that media journalism has been regulated. And I said, that's not the way it works. <laughs> the horse has bolted a long time ago. With AI now, it's already, you know, we've gone from open AI, which is not so open, <laughs> to, okay, so we have a problem and an opportunity. The only solution, I still believe, is education. But the education we need, I think, has to go beyond the classroom. Okay, so that's what I would ask you to do. All of you guys need to be multipliers if you're going to join us. We will hold another one of these things, I hope. We will scrape all the bits of content that we have and see what we make of it. In the same way that we're going to make, you know, come up with projects on pages 12 and 13 of this thing. Okay? Thank you for joining us.